Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here, and thank you to all the people live streaming us right now. I hope you're finding an immense amount of value in the presentations today. Um, thanks for coming to join us. Um, I work at Forbes Crypto Markets, and we are an online data-driven information source on all things crypto. Today, we'll be talking about building dApps, the value proposition of dApps today, and what makes Hedera exciting for entrepreneurs and developers. This panel is a great opportunity for our guests to speak about the value that they're bringing to the space, um, but this panel is really for you. So before we start, could you raise your hand if you are a developer? Excellent. And investors? Thank you. And entrepreneurs? We're so happy to have all of you here with us today. Um, now let's meet our panelists. First, starting with John. John is the founder of CU Ledger. John is recognized as a thought leader in tech and financial application development within the credit union industry. Next, we have Michael Fang. Michael is the co-founder and CEO of Coin Alpha. He's a serial entrepreneur who started his career as a derivatives structurer and trader. Nat Wynn is the co-founder and CEO of Organifi, a project aimed at changing the supply chain in the organic food industry. Daniel Rice is the co-founder and CTO of Sagewise. He is a veteran software engineer with expertise in distributed ledgers and finance. He's helped launch more than 20 products with over 5 million downloads. And last but not least, we have Simon Olson. Simon is the director of new business development at Megaloo, the highest performing stock in the Americas in 2016 and 2017. Simon was a member of Google's new business development team as a, and a partner at one of Draper Fisher Jurvetson's affiliate venture capital funds. Thank you all for joining me. Let's get into the questions. Where do you see crypto headed overall? I'll, I'll jump in, guess first. First of all, I just want to really quickly uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction. I'd love to take all the credit for CU Ledger, but I have some amazing co-founders, uh, Rick Cranston, Julie Esser, uh, John Ainsworth, just fantastic people. But where crypto in general, uh, if we're talking about currency, and, and, and that's kind of what I feel like when you say crypto, that's where we're headed. I feel like we've been in this Napster mode for a while, it's like not quite legal, but it has a lot of use case, like, and we all like music, and we like this idea of you know, not having to buy the whole album, but there's a lot of us that are kind of uncomfortable, and so I think you know, we're headed towards the iTunes. That, that would be my sort of assessment. Um, so uh, in, my, in my opinion, I think crypto is really the fusion of money and tech, and um, it, whatever happens, it will be, be a major financial asset class in a few years, um, either in terms of native utility tokens, which are tokens that capture the value of a network, or via digital traditional assets, where they're next generation, um, you know, more efficient and transparent versions of paper, equities, debt, and other financial instruments. Um, I'm sure, if we, do we go, or do you want to say? If, if, uh... Yeah, by the way, guys, <laughs> you don't have to go in order. Oh, okay, cool. Jump in whenever you have an idea. Yeah, um, so, so for me, I guess uh, I really want to see how the, the general financial system might be looking to adopt cryptos and uh, how uh, we can uh, help to make that happen. Uh, now, uh, like, it's, it's really hard to, to see right now with a low transaction speed, uh, but hopefully a new platform like Hedera uh, can, can help to make that happen. So. so. I think the biggest thing for me is if we don't solve some of these usability issues that exist right now in cryptocurrency, then we're probably not really going anywhere. Uh, so I, it's, it's awesome to see most of the audience, audience was developers. Uh, and I think those are the biggest questions, right? For us to get energy back into the space where it's, it's I think, from a year ago and now, obviously, uh, we're kind of in this bearish market right now. and. Uh, a lot of that is just the reality of the difficulty of using it and the difficulty of using the apps that are on the platforms right now, the costs associated, all those things. So I think that's what has to change. I guess echoing John's initial comments, I think that we're, what we're going to see is probably an, an evolution or a maturation process. So it reminds me a lot of the evolution of venture capital. Uh, in venture capital, initially you were able to fund an, uh, an, a project based on an idea 
then it became a working prototype, and nowadays you need a working prototype and, and you have to be able to show growth. So I think the bar is going to, of who's able to get funding, is going to consistently uh, rise. And as you said, John, um, you know, regulators are still trying to figure this out. Um, we're seeing regulation come to, to cryptocurrencies, um, but as far as where the market's headed, um, we're looking to see all of this back end, all of this wonderful development and usability just be integrated into the system so that people can use blockchain, use distributed ledger technology, use Hedera without having to actually understand how they're using it. Um, what about the future of dApps? You know, from my perspective, dApps will just become apps. Um, you know, you think about the internet and how it kind of grew, and to begin with, uh, everybody needed a website, and there were lots of people who had problems that the inter internet would solve, but it took time for them to understand. You know, if, if you remember, um, you know, IP, not in terms of intellectual property, but internet protocol, an IP address was a foreign concept, and I would, I would argue now it's pretty generic in our lexicon, right? We're going to see that same thing happen here. Um, I think that these, the dApps will become sort of uh, platform, you know, they'll have more characteristics with a platform than they will an app, really. I think that's the big play here, and you, you saw it in uh, Patrick's demo, where it, it's, it's much more... Um, you know, it, it's rising more to a higher level to bring that utility. Uh, and I think uh, Simon's comments are very important. The, the friction, I think, is identity. And, you know, at, at CU Ledger, that's one of the things that we're really super focused on is, is identity, self-sovereign identity in general, because what, you know, you can't transact or do anything until you know who you're dealing with. And I love the combination of those two technologies, Hedera and, and looking at the sovereign platform. So we've been looking into that for some time. I just... Uh... I wanted to jump in on this question because I think the biggest thing around dApps is, again, the usability is not there. If, if we solve the usability issues, then potentially it can be useful, but um, if they're hard to use, if you have to install special plugins or it doesn't work on your phone, it's just not useful to people, uh, and the general population doesn't care about decentralization, I don't think it's a feature for them. There might be uses for it that are and side benefits, but just selling it as this is a decentralized version of of Uber, I don't think anyone really cares. Yeah, so, um, so at Coin Alpha, we've been uh, running dApps for the past year uh, with millions of dollars worth of transactions flowing through them. And so we've learned a lot through that process. Um, a lot of assumptions we had going into it were challenged and were flat or wrong, but we also learned a lot of things. Um, one of the things we learned is that I think eventually everyone wants to kind of believe that the end state of kind of like dApps being kind of like how everything is used uh, will happen, and we totally believe in that as well. But I think the path to get there, dApps have to deliver something that is not just incrementally faster or more efficient. Um, we think they have to give people something that they can't otherwise get today. And in a lot of cases, um, what we've learned is that the, the people that dApps are really good for are individuals. Um, they're individuals who can access something that is currently only available to large institutions or companies. And because they're essentially able to access something they couldn't otherwise get, uh, which in our case are financial products, um, that's why they're attracted and they're willing to go through that pain point of installing Chrome extensions and other pieces of software and learning new technologies. Um, we think that for large companies, because the centralized alternatives to dApps already kind of already work well and they're familiar, um, the, the incremental kind of like benefits in terms of you know, efficiency or, or, or even you know, privacy aren't are kind of outweighed by um, the, 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 the blockers in terms of adopting new technology. So we think that for dApps to really flourish, they really should focus on kind of like growing that early adopter uh, individual community. Um, yeah, actually, this question is special, uh, very applicable to us. Uh, with Organifi, we're working with organic farmers. And if you think of farmers, you don't think technology. Uh, so, so, so we had to design for, for like, the future of the app so that, to be honest, like, our, our farmers right now, they, they're logging in, and they already have that Metamax inbuilt, so they don't need to install any additional Chrome extension to be able to start doing those transactions. 
So, so that's why I see, to your point, John, there is, is you use it just like a normal application with your login and password, but on the back end, it is a, a D app, and, and they have no idea. But, but those, those data is going through the Ethereum network. So I want to get into this a little bit more. Um, so far, what's been built so far has really been sidelined by slow consensus on platforms. Um, so as excited as we might be about a decentralized ride share or P2P marketplace, or you name it, um, there really hasn't been a way to leverage it so far. Um, we can look at CryptoKitties on Ethereum, and for as adorable as it is, um, and it's a great test of the network, it doesn't show how much dApps could change our lives. Um, people want convenience, and people want a real value proposition from using dApps. So how far do you think we are from that happening? So to kind of combine the last two questions, I guess, you know, anyone that lived through Web 1.0, we've seen this movie before. There's going to be a transitionary period. People are going to make a fortune creating, you know, consulting business to bring people onto uh, distributed ledgers, just like they made a fortune with, you know, bringing people online via websites and things like that. There's going to be America online, there's going to be Netscapes, they're going to come and go. But to me, I'm really excited about the possibilities because I think what's essentially going to happen is the web is going to be turned upside down. Um, as Patrick alluded to in his presentation, there's no immutable law of physics that says that the web needs to be monetized via advertising. It just evolved that way. It could have e evolved in any other, in other enumerate ways. And I think that the ascendance of micropayments is going to uh, enable a lot of other things, the, the, the likes of which we can't even fathom at this point. So I'm pretty optimistic. You know, I, I like to think of it in two terms. Um, technology comes in either revolution or evolution. And, you know, we've seen it in the finance business. A good example of a revolutionary um, a platform is to taking a picture of a check. You know, that just burned like wildfire. It was something that was convenient. It met all the criteria you were talking about, and uh, people wanted it. But then there are other things that are evolutionary. Um, because of the speed of this, and, and uh, the, you have to look at it. I think we're looking at it from the consumer's point of view, but we also have to look at those consumers as content builders and other people that are, are you know, Hero FM is a great example, and what it can do to enable this, this economy that's moving more towards folks who are... Uh, individually employed or, or SEP accounts, those sorts of things. And so I see this as revolutionary. It has scale. Uh, I think people will leave a platform to get to it because I think that it, it brings that value. Um, and I think the, the other differentiator is it's something that didn't exist before. And so with those three things, I, I think it's, it's, it could be faster than we think uh, just because people tend to adopt that sort of stuff very quickly. But it looks evolutionary because like the smartphone, we had Blackberries forever. It was the App Store and those sorts of things that were the game changers. Yeah, uh, to me, I think speed is a baseline, but that's not the reason why people aren't using dApps. People aren't using dApps today because um, you know, as a product person, you have to fire a product in order to hire a new product. And right now, even something like CryptoKitties, um, you know, compared to kind of like the top games right now, like Clash of Clans, uh, you know, any, anything on mobile you can think of, it's a, it's a pretty poor equivalent. So I think that for dApps to kind of survive, they have to give people something they can't get otherwise today. And that's something that might be, you know, more fun uh, or something even something that's like more native to the decentralized ecosystem. So do you think this idea of someone being able to use micropayments to, say, um, sell their own data um, in, in medical research or um, do a job in, in some kind of decentralized economy is part of that? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, do you want to finish that? Oh, yes, uh, I, I think absolutely. I think that's the example of something that it's, it's enabling something that someone is not able to get today in a more centralized world. Um, and, and along with that use case, uh, so just this last 48 hours, uh, Organic 5 created a new use case to use micropayments. So for the first time ever, um, you can actually, uh, after, like, you know, it's great to know about your food and how great it was prepared, but there's nothing you can do about it. Well, using micropayment, you can now send a tip to the farmer, and never before that you can, can do it without like needing to open a bank account, right? Like not everyone have a bank account. Now you can actually tip your farmer and say, hey, appreciate the great stuff you've been doing. So, so giving people something that, that they haven't been able to do before using a micropayment on decentralized application will really help to push that adoption. Yeah, it, addressing further. the unbanked is really, really huge. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. 
All right, we'll get into our next question. So why did you choose to build on Hedera over other, all the other platforms out there? Where do you see the opportunity in Hedera? Um, and what do you see with it as different to any of the existing blockchains and platforms? For our SDK, which is something we originally built for Ethereum, we didn't get to build what we wanted to build because of gas associated with it. Essentially, the way our SDK works is it gets inserted in other people's code and it adds some legal infrastructure. And because of the way it works, it's actually increasing the gas cost of every transaction that runs on that particular dApp. So uh, in the case of Ethereum, we didn't get to build what we really wanted to build because the gas costs were too high, especially with things like proxy uh, contract communication that we wanted to do. So when I started reading about Hedera, I think the first thing that I was interested in was can we get the cost down enough that it won't matter that our SDK is installed in someone's, in someone's application. And, uh, and that's why we're here, basically. I think that's the biggest reason. I guess in terms of why Hedera and why now, it reminds me a lot of the uh, evolution of um, artificial intelligence. So the other day I was watching uh, Kai Fu Liu, who is an artificial intelligence pioneer. And what he talked about was the evolution or the phases that it passed through. So first they tried rules-based systems, but they weren't scalable. And then they tried uh, database systems, but the data sets weren't big enough. And finally now, the reason why apparently it's taking off is because they're using a data-based approach and the data sets are enormous, enabling them to derive information from it. So so the question then becomes, you know, in the DLT space, why Hedera and why now? And I think uh, heretofore, uh, when you tried to do something, the throughput wasn't good, the energy use wasn't good, you had to use, you know, these uh, mining, expensive mining rigs, uh, the, the uh, transaction costs were very high, and I think um, what's beautiful about, or elegant, or eloqu eloquent about Hedera is that it really combines all these different features that make up for the, um, sort of, the shortcomings of the blockchain uh, uh, system. Yeah, so first one big reason was um, support for Solidity. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of, you know, support negative- Support for Solidity? Solidity, yeah. A lot of, there's a lot of issues with Solidity right now, but to us, it's, um, you know, right now at least, it's the JavaScript of the blockchain world. Um, now, probably not the most elegant language, but the one that's most widely adopted and the one that's easiest to serve developers um, and to hire developers with that expertise in. So that was one big reason. Oh, so quick question off the side, too. How can we fix some of the bugs um, that Solidity, like all of the bug classes Solidity has reintroduced? Um, so so well, well, I think it's important to note that it's simply a, um, a programming language. So um, any programmer is going to introduce bugs. Um, it's, it's simply an abstraction layer on top of some type of like, you know, like virtual machine, whether it's like Ethereum virtual machine or WebAssembly mm -hmm. virtual machine that's on the, um, that's on a blockchain. So uh, I think it's more of a, it's more of a programming abstraction and the, the, the responsibility to address bugs lies more on the tooling and the developer side. Yeah, so I think there's a, a few things about this bug question that are, uh, first of all, like you're saying, like, uh, Solidity is just a language that sits on top of the Ethereum virtual machine originally, and now it's being put onto other virtual machines. But their approach with Ethereum, which I mean can't really be argued with at this point, was kind of like a let's build something that's really helpful for a lot of developers, which is let's copy some ideas from JavaScript, which JavaScript isn't really known as the best security-oriented language. So there were negatives to that as far as people losing money in 2017, over a billion dollars were lost on the Ethereum blockchain through smart contract issues. So um, I think that's something that will continue to harden those systems. There's been a lot of upgrades and improvements to Ethereum uh, and Solidity uh, since the beginning. And um, the beauty of using that language is you can, you can automatically gain those uh, benefits right away. But um, there are other bugs that can exist even under the layer that the developers are coding in in the virtual machine layer. So even if you code something up correctly in Solidity, there can still be an underlying issue that you don't even see in your code because of the virtual machine. And that, that pr problem is probably gonna exist on other platforms as well. Yeah, and hopefully auditing and, and better bug bounty programs will help find some of this. Uh, 
Um, so I'll just go back to why Hedera. Um, <laughs> so uh, basically, um, what our use case, uh, we want to be able to have information from when the animal was born and what it ate throughout. So, so there's a lot of transaction information going through uh, all the time. And, and all the current blockchain platform, uh, they don't have the same support structure for the amount of transaction that we need. So when I came across Hedera, being able to take on a lot of transaction, uh, I felt like this is the right platform to be on to be able to scale this out to the million farmers of, out there that very need in need of this solution. So, so that's why we came here this weekend to really be able to test that technology out. Yeah, I can see that for showing an animal's whole life cycle um, to, to report each step of the process, you definitely need something that's fast um, and you need something that you can trust yeah. um, and that can handle micropayments. So that makes yeah, a lot of definitely. sense. Um, well, I wanted to get into uh, the core value proposition of each of your DAP projects. And we've talked a little bit now about Organifi and how that works. Um, so John, could you tell me a little bit about what you're working on? Sure. So we have uh, two primary projects. Uh, the, the one that most everyone's heard of is CEO Ledger. And, and the value proposition of CEO Ledger, and, and something that we didn't really talk about, you know, one of the big value propositions of this DLT technology is it's collaborative in nature. Um, it allows organizations to work together uh, in a way that they don't necessarily have to trust each other or they can build a trust framework. And uh, CEO Ledger is really um, focused in on, uh, you mentioned the unbanked. Um, you know, the, the biggest barrier to, and you, you hit a nail on the head, to folks getting involved in a banking system, which, by the way, is the number one stepping stone to really succeeding in life, uh, if you look at kind of, you know, all the, all the diff World Bank and all the different reporting out there, is getting um, enough credentials to get into the bank, to have the right things, to pass the KYC, the AML, those sorts of things. And so, um, CEO Ledger starts off with a, an identity solution that uh, we're looking to be credit union Y called My CUID that would be a portable identity that you own. It's a self-sovereign identity, something that you take with you. And so it's different than the current identity, partnering with uh, Evernim, which is one of the founders of Sovereign, uh, and allowing people to really just have their identity and store these sorts of attributes and these sort of things in a world that we've never had before. It's not Google or somebody that's taking that data and the reason it's free is they're monetizing by selling it. I love the use of consent, that word uh, Patrick used. So that's the, that's the value proposition is, is to have a platform that promotes collaboration amongst the credit unions in a way they've never been able to do before. And honestly, who's happy with the number of usernames and passwords you have? Anybody? Raise your hand if you're some sort of sadist, right? So <laughs> One person. <laughs> right. So I think one person raised their hand. That's a weird person. But other than that, um, nobody's happy with that. And, and it's, again, before you can use any of these solutions, it's where we got to start. So that's CEO Ledger's mission. And then I'm also proud to announce Hash Labs, which is our partner. And uh, we're working on CXAU, which is... Uh, a gold-backed cryptocurrency. When I say gold-backed, I don't mean, I don't know, there's a lot of things out there. I mean working with the Royal Canadian Mint, Dylan Gage, our partners, people who actually do this where it's an actual currency that we can work with and build together. And that's going to help a lot of people who need that uh, in countries and in different areas. And, and if you get a chance, talk to the experts on that, the, the doors and, and the CEO, Mark. But that's our value. stable process. coin there? Yeah, I think so. I mean, from our perspective, it, it's helpful if you're in countries where you really need to convert that to something that you can keep track of. And again, it comes come back to that. It's almost a sovereign account. You know, it's, it's kind of a similar uh, similar concept, that self-sovereignness. So that's us. Cool. Dan, could you tell us about SageWise? Great. So our core value proposition is mainly that we believe there will be bugs and there will be reasons why people need to change contracts. And so we're building an SDK that helps people do that in a responsible way. I, I think on Ethereum we've seen a lot of contracts where actually the owner has these kind of admin rights over it and we've actually seen hacks occur because of that and different things like that. So we, we a long time ago started looking at this, going back to the DAO and saying, how can we actually stop these issues from occurring on the networks? And um, we kind of mix what we're doing with legal because my co-founder is a securities attorney by training. And so our, our focus is bringing law to blockchain, essentially, in a responsible way. Michael? Uh, yeah, so if you look at a lot of the, the catastrophes that happened in financial markets over the past 20 years, like Lehman Brothers defaulting or uh, Bernie Madoff, you know, defrauding people out of billions of dollars, um, a lot of it comes down to the fact that traditional finance uh, requires trust, and it doesn't, isn't very transparent. Um, 
Now, with blockchain technology and smart contracts, we finally have the ability to codify kind of like um, both asset ownership uh, and also the logic entailed in financial contracts um, on the blockchain. So at Coin Alpha, we create what we call decentralized financial products. Um, and uh, we focus on a protocol that we call the basket protocol, um, which enables um, people, uh, individuals to create uh, essentially tokens that hold a set of other tokens. Um, and we believe that this represents an evolution over the traditional fund structure. Um, and so that enables um, you know, people who want to be asset managers to create vehicles who couldn't otherwise do it before. Uh, it creates liquidity providers to generate arbitrage profits from, from providing liquidity to these new instruments. And finally, enables investors um, to have infinite customization and selection um, over what uh, they can invest into. And for our next question, is there anything we haven't addressed so far? Uh, oh, I wanted, this question is for all of you, um, mainly for developers, but also for, for enterprise business owners. So if you wanted to do something with Hedera, if your company wanted to run on Hedera, Walk me through the steps for entrepreneurs, um, and then walk me through the steps um, for a developer within a company that, that says, hey, I want to use this. I think we should build on this. Um, what kind of issues are going to come up? What kind of obstacles are, are they going to face along the way? What are some ways they can address it? But maybe let's just start with um, entrepreneurs. What are the steps to get involved? So I, I was thinking more about and, uh, people within companies, developers trying to do things okay. within companies. And I think it's actually super interesting because uh, it reminds me a lot of the, uh, the children's story of the boy who cried wolf. So I, for those uh, in the audience who are from other countries, basically the story is that there's a, a little boy and he's sort of guarding the city at night and he cries wolf, and the first time he does it, all the villagers come out ready to you know, defend themselves from the wolf. And the second time he does it, and there's no wolf, uh, half the villagers come. And then the third time he does it, and there really is a wolf, no one comes. So I think what, what basically uh, one thing that developers inside of companies are going to have to overcome is the fact that uh, there was a lot of hype around blockchain and uh, it was a wonderful, uh, revolutionary, first-generation technology. Uh, but the problems, as we talked about, you know, uh, they couldn't process very many uh, transactions per second. It wasn't enterprise-grade ABFT uh, uh, secure. The transaction costs associated with processing a transaction were high. So it was an interesting technology, but it wasn't really feasible at enterprise scale. So I think there's going to be an issue to overcome, but that's also going to create an opportunity. The issue to overcome is that a lot of people at corporations are going to be like, yep, I looked at that. There's really nothing there. It's not feasible. Um, where the opportunity is for those developers who are going uh, and able to convince uh, their CEOs and CTOs to actually embrace the technology, I think now we finally have a technology that overcomes those in initial issues and that uh, people who are able to launch things now are going to have a uh, be a step ahead of their competitors. Uh, I'll add to that for entrepreneurs because uh, uh, it happened to us. We, we, you, before you choose a blockchain platform to develop on, it could be Hedera or anything else, you, you really be a, need to marry your use case to that platform. You, you need to find that is, is your use case need that platform capabilities because each platform would have the pro and cons, right? So, so if, if you, like, you have like a really low transaction level and very high transaction value and you just put it on like a platform that doesn't have a security, it's not gonna work. So, so you really need to, like, as a team, to decide that that platform is the right fit for your use case. Yeah, so uh, I think of applications as ongoing conversations between developers and users. And so uh, on the developer side, to use a platform, uh, one thing you need is you know, a way to interact reliably uh, with the network. So we call that a client. And terms. And so having a robust client that's well documented that works often is really important. Um, on the user side, users need some way to interact with the network as well in order to access the application. 
And so today we call that a wallet. Um, and so the having that kind of like robust wallet infrastructure, as well as a robust um, client infrastructure, uh, we think is key for a platform to succeed. And I think that's very important that we that you talk about it as well. It's not this is not blockchain. It's it's something different. You're right. There's been so much hype around blockchain, and a lot of companies probably don't want to hear it. Um, so talking about what it's not, maybe before what it is, <laughs> might be a better approach. What about the steps to to onboarding if if you were starting to develop with Hedera? I still think it comes down mostly to kind of non-technical things like economics. Uh, com big companies that we work with are looking at, you know, wh what kind of transaction volume can we put through the network and how much is it going to cost us? So one of the problems with a lot of the networks is they have variable cost transactions based on how busy the network is at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a huge problem. An enterprise isn't going to sign up for an unknown cost of transaction volume, basically. So uh, I think it's... Internally, it's a marketing effort to get people to sign on at a high level for, for a project using a certain technology stack. And it's especially true for this type of technology. Enterprises aren't interested necessarily in decentralizing their technology. They're interested in controlling everything in their ecosystem in a lot of cases. So uh, that can't be the sell. It has to be something else. So real quick, um, you got to get a live chicken because there's going to be a sacrifice involved. And then you go to Hedera. You download the SDK. I'd start off with the private permissioned SDK, learn that. I want to echo what Michael said, start to build a scaffolding or a framework or a client or whatever you want to call around it. And give your, you know, put a bounty out there. Give your developers, say, hey, whoever does this wins whatever gadget it is they want of the week and give them something to do. Awesome. Well, we just have a little time left. So 30 seconds each. This is going to be a quick fire shotgun round. It's five years from now. Where are dApps today? Go. So it's, it's uh, continuous execution. You have these wallets, but inside the wallets, you also have these contracts that are coming to fruition, things like uh, Michael's product, uh, and you're seeing them sort of you know, come in. You have some more insight into, if you're a business owner, entrepreneur, your cash flow, if you're a person, into your daily life and what you're doing. All right. So, uh, just like the blockchain enables you to be your own bank, uh, it also enables you to be your own asset custodian. Uh, so instead of having to give your capital to some fund manager who might lose it, uh, you, you're purchasing assets that you control. Um, five years from now, I want to see everyone using an app, a D app, without knowing they're using a D app, uh, because uh, you've done the interface layer for every person to use it so seamless that uh, they just use it for whatever they need. If they are being used, then I think the transaction confidence will be a lot higher. Like credit cards first coming onto the internet, people were afraid to use them. Um, cryptocurrency has to get to the same place, and, and dApps will follow. Facebook is gone, having failed to acquire the dApp equivalent of Instagram or uh, WhatsApp. Google is uh, severely hamstrung and relying on other businesses because people have moved from advertising focus of monetization for the web to other forms, perhaps, micropayments. Thank you very much.